It's a great honor to introduce Peter Raymond. Peter Raymond's filmmaking ties together multiple themes which have been a very much a part of trans history and a part of its mission. Study of the North, a commitment to telling indigenous stories, the creation of Canadian culture. Peter Raymond is a writer, director, and producer of film, both documentary and drama. Over his career, he has produced and directed over 100 documentary films and television programs. And he's received countless awards, both international and national, for his work, including the Canadian Genie, four Gemini Awards, several gold and super, silver Hugels, and other international honors. His documentary feature, which I think a lot of people have seen, Shake Hands with the Devil, The Journey of Romeo Dallaire, was honored with the 2005 Audience Award for World Cinema Documentaries at the Sundance Film Festival and the 2007 Emmy Award for Best Documentary. Peter Raymond made his first documentary films while studying film and politics at Queen's University. Then his career shifted to the National Film Board in Montreal in the 1970s, where he worked for a number of years as an editor, director, and producer. Some of his earliest films explored political events, flora scenes from a leadership convention I know some people have seen, and increasingly his films focused on analysis of social, cultural, and political issues of contemporary importance in Canada, both in Canada and abroad. While Peter was at the NFB, he worked extensively in the North, taught film and video production in the Canadian Arctic. At what was then Frobisher Bay at the Rehabilitation Centre, he instructed filmmaking to young Inuit artists who then turned their own talents to filmmaking. Some of his early NFB films, like The Hunter, were the products of this period. His film Magic in the Sky, uh, made in 1981, which explores the coming of television to the North, won international acclaim. And many of his other Northern films, like The Experimental Eskimo, between two worlds, just to name a couple of them, similarly explore indigenous life and indigenous settler relations with tremendous sensitivity and acuity. They are very powerful films. In 1979, when Peter moved to Toronto, he founded his own production company, and that has evolved into White Pine Productions, which you may know when you watch TV and you watch the TV series Cracked is behind that innovative series. <coughs> Peter Raymond has been, in other words, an immense creative force in Canada and internationally in the, on the film scene. He has played an incredibly important role, not just in creating cu Canadian culture, but in posing and asking those very difficult questions about <coughs> our history and our politics that need to be asked. I could offer a much longer introduction about all his accomplishments, but I know you are here to hear him, not me, and so I want to turn things over to him. Thank you, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, uh, great to be here. I, I'm del really delighted to be invited to talk about the time in, uh, in the 70s and early 80s in the Arctic when the Inuit made some of their first films. Um, partly because in the last few days, I've been watching all these films to prepare for this and choosing clips from them. And it's been such an emotional experience for me. I've been uh, getting up at uh, five o'clock in the morning and because of several hours of stuff that I've been going through. And uh, oh boy, so many of these dear people who uh, many are no longer with us uh, and we're very, very close friends uh, in Cape Dorset and, and Corbusier Bay in the Blue Lake. <coughs> so it's been wonderful for me to have had this opportunity to uh, prepare this little talk for you this evening. So thank you for inviting me to do this. Uh, um, it, we'll, start, we'll start with, uh, I don't usually give talks, so excuse me if, my, if the technology isn't uh, right and I'm a bit hesitant to do this. I, I'm a filmmaker and I usually hide behind cameras and are not used to being in front of cameras or in front of audiences. Here's, uh, here's the poster for, t for, for this little 
uh, this group of, of, of talks at, at Trent, and I was delighted to receive this from Joan because um, this this photograph is 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 identified. It was taken by Garlani, who was a photographer in the 50s and 60s for the did a lot for the government of Canada and the National Film Board. And this photograph is identified in, in Library and Archives Canada as, quote, three Inuit men with their brownie cameras await the arrival of Governor General Massey, Resolute Bay, March 1956. And they're not identified, these three gentlemen, because I guess nobody bothered to ask them their names, but here they are with their brownies. And when I looked at this uh, photograph, and it's from uh, uh, the talk that's being given next next Thursday in this in this room by by Carol Kane. I thought, gee, that guy in the middle looks familiar, and you can see this medal he's wearing, and uh, the spectacles are are particular. And so you go in and you look at him a little more closely, and I thought, my God, that's Joseph Idlaut. Now Joseph Idlaut was uh, the uh, Canada's model Eskimo, and he's wearing his Queen's medal. And uh, we made a film about Joseph Idlaut uh, called Between Two Worlds, um, which I'll show you an excerpt of in a few minutes. And so it's fitting in a way that there he is uh, on the poster that is used to advertise these, uh, these talks. It's a very kind of tragic story, the story of, of Joseph, uh, told in our film through his son, Peter Panelu, who still lives in... Uh, in uh, Resolute. He doesn't live in Ray. He lives in Pond Inlet now. Uh, Doug Wilkinson took this photograph of uh, of Idlaut and his son and his family, which was used on the back of the two dollar bill for many years. But we don't have two dollar bills anymore, and many of these photographs at that time uh, are are they're deep in the archives. But this is uh, Joseph and his family preparing to go seal hunting. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of, uh, of Land of the Long Day in a few minutes as well. Doug Wilkinson's most uh, beautiful film that he made in 1952. Uh, here's Joseph. Uh, you know, Doug's, many of Doug's photos were, were in color but, but have been re reproduced in black and white. And the first time I saw this photograph in color, I thought, oh my god, it, it brings you much closer to this man. Very tragic story. He was the Kind of the go-between, we, we call the film Between Two Worlds, and he uh, he was the go-between between, between the white world and the, and the Inuit world. Uh, he he lived. Uh, he was moved from um, for uh, up to Resolute Bay, and uh, lived on the edge of the army army base there, <coughs> and he was kind of the interpreter for the for the white people dealing with the Inuit people. And he was very popular and very hospitable and had a lovely laugh. And uh, everybody loved him. But he saw, uh, and he was awarded the Queen's Medal as the kind of model Eskimo. Uh, the, sad, the sad story is that uh, he took his own life eventually in 1968 and drove his uh, skidoo over a, over a cliff. And uh, our film, Between Two Worlds, Tells, tells the story of his life as sort of a metaphor for uh, those, that group of people. This is the, the film we made back in uh, 1990. Barry, Barry Greenwald directed this film, mm -hmm. the same uh, director who directed Experimental Eskimos, which some of you have seen. Uh, my first uh, picture of uh, talking about representation of Inuit people and representing themselves. The first picture I saw of Inuit people was this uh, photograph that was taken by my father in 1955 uh, in Cape Dorset. And he was there with a group of uh, military people. He was part of the National Defense College and they took them all around the world and they went up to see the Dew Line and on the way back from the Dew Line I guess they took them to Cape Dorset because that's where uh, it was a, just a lovely village of about 700 people. And Dad took this picture and sent it to me. And you can see these two dark figures over there, just kind of silhouettes. 
And I remember uh, having this. It was a little on a little postcard uh, when I was five years old, and I and I kept this, and I kept looking at these people and wondering who they were and what they were like. And it was I remember this very very clearly. Dad took this photograph as well of the dog team. And uh, here he is. Here's my dad. He sent me this. Uh, he sent me. He brought back this beautiful little carving. Uh, which is a ptarmigan, I guess. And you know, the early Inuit carvings were just tiny little things like this that you keep in your pocket, or they were children's, uh, children's toys or amulets, like this little seal that I brought along tonight as well. It was really in 1949, I think, that the Inuit carvings changed and became carvings with bases, right? That you could put it on your mantelpiece, and you could charge more money for them because they were bigger. I love this one especially because it reminds me the Inuit carvers talk about releasing the spirit from the stone. And this, this, this one feels it's still coming out of the stone. And that's what Inuit filmmakers talked about too, the early filmmakers, about, about looking for the spirit. And that's, that's kind of the theme of this talk. Anyway, there's my dad. And there's, uh, you probably don't uh, recognize this fellow as me. Uh, when I first went to the Arctic in 1974, um, and this is me in Cape Dorset, I was very fortunate to get a job at the National Film Board of Canada in Montreal out of university, out of Queen's University, and get <coughs> hired um, by these two fellows. Uh, that's Wolf Koenig with Paul Anka uh, making Lonely Boy, and Tom Daly, who was my mentor at the Film Board. And these guys taught me everything about filmmaking. And it was Wolf who uh, asked me to go to Cape Dorset when I was 24 years old in 1974. And um, because he had, he had started a, a filmmaking workshop in Cape Dorset to teach uh, young Inuit people uh, animation, animation filmmaking. Um, everyone could see television coming and it had already come to Frobisher Bay. It was soon going to come to all these little communities throughout the Arctic. And there was a feeling both uh, from the Inuit leadership and the territorial government and people at the film board that um, if the Inuit people were going to be barraged by television from the south, they should uh, learn to make their own television and make their own films in their own way, in their own language, in their own style. So a, a film workshop was started in, um, in Cape Dorset. And Cape Dorset was chosen because it was kind of the, the center of Inuit artistry. That's where the James Houston had gone and the, these first carvings had been turned into marketable products and the first printmaking, as I'm sure you know, uh, came out of, out of Cape Dorset. So I'm going to show you a little clip from... Oh, so in, in 1972, in October of 72, they started this workshop. They brought equipment up and Filmmakers came up and taught local uh, Inuit people to make animated films. And, and the, the, the compilation of that first year of filmmaking, the short films they made, were cut together and sent off to uh, a film festival in um, the Zagreb of Yugoslavia, the big international animation film festival. And, and the, they got the special jury prize, uh, just their, their first year of filmmaking because the films were so extraordinary, so unique, and so kind of raw and new. And I'm going to show you uh, a little clip here from some of these first ones. So, so my job, because I was working with Wolf, was to cut these films together into one reel, splice them together, put some little titles on them, and send them off to film festivals. Oh, I'm it. 
what each of us was working on as editors. And uh, I, I remember showing this collection of these uh, quite extraordinary animated films from Cape Dorset and we, everyone was mesmerized. They've never seen anything like this before. It was shocking and wonderful and extraordinary. So uh, I was delighted when uh, I was um, asked by Wolf Koenig to go to Cape Dorset, and uh, after they won this international jury prize, the Zagreb Film Festival, to go up to Cape Dorset and make a film about the making of teaching and making of films by these young Inuit filmmakers. And this is 1974. I was 24 years old. I'd never made a. I'd made a couple of student films at Queens, and I'd been editing at the Film Board. So this was my uh, premiere <laughs> film as a filmmaker. Yeah. Pretty, pretty neat. Uh, those were the good old days, I guess, when things like this uh, happened. Um, so, um, let me just show you a clip from this film. It's called Sikusilamut, which, which means the people from the place where the ice meets the sea. And they named their workshop Sikusilamut, the people of Cape Dorset, the, 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 uh, the people who started the ran this workshop. It was run by uh, some pretty remarkable people, which I'll tell you about in a minute. In October of 1972, Very embarrassing the National narrator's Film voice Canada, here. The Department of Indian and Northern Affairs and the Northwest Territories government established an animation film workshop in Cape Dorset. The 
young people of the community took to it immediately. Their first films won the jury prize at the Animation Film Festival in Zagreb, Yugoslavia. Some of these animators lost their interest in filmmaking, but eight or ten of them have adopted the workshop as a place to meet their friends, try out new ideas, and perfect new skills. Anya's grandmother told her Inuit legends just as rock music came to Cape Dorset. Her films will pass on these stories to many northern communities whose rhythm has been changed by southern technology. some of these shots because uh, you'll get to the filmmaking in a minute. But when I saw this, I hadn't watched this film for about 40 years and uh, I remember sitting on the back of that skidoo shooting that shot driving down the main miles south to be developed and today the group is screening footage shot more than a month ago <laughs> Odyssey is uh, was the kind of uh, leader of the workshop. He was an actor in the film White Dawn, which some of you may. He is using old photographs to create a film history of his people. Sadly, he passed away about oh, 20 years ago now. He became a very close friend. They were him. taken by an Inuit hunter and developed under a blanket. Chu <laughs> This technique is called pixelation. A stone is shifted a few inches. Two frames of film are exposed. A stone is moved again. The filmmakers are building an Inukshuk, stone creatures traditionally created by the Inuit to populate the vast northern spaces and reassure others that people had passed that way. Animating a film 
by photographing grains of sand moved about on a light box. He made a dozen films in Cape Dorset and then decided to go to a Vancouver art school for further training. The West Coast climate agrees with Tamun. He finds it difficult to adapt to the temperature when he comes home. For his soundtrack, Tamun composed a tune on a dulcimer he built himself. making this film and doing some film instruction as well because some of the filmmakers wanted to learn live action filmmaking as well as animation filmmaking. So I brought up these little porta pack cameras and Super 8 cameras and that was really the beginning of uh, Inuit filmmaking, in, in, certainly in the Eastern Arctic. And it's interesting that both uh, Peter Panlu, who you saw, the photographer, and uh, Idlaut, were these early Inuit photographers, stills photographers. And these are pe people who, you know, the, the young Inuit filmmakers wanted to honor by using their photographs uh, and telling stories about the early days in their community. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful time for me in Cape Dorset. And they would take us out on, on uh, caribou hunts and seal hunts and taught us how to make igloos and I was, I was re recounting a story at, at dinner earlier of, of us going out one day and uh, I would, uh, I, the, film, the white filmmakers would sit on these hamotics, which were these long sleds you'd pull behind the skidoos and uh, you'd bouncing along and up and down rough terrain but straight, straight as an arrow we, we were on skidoos for three hours then they'd stop, everyone would jump off and make some tea have a little primus stove or something. We'd all drink tea, jump back on the skidoos, and go for another two or three hours, straight as an arrow over the over the ice and over little hills and little islands. And then suddenly, uh, suddenly, they turn left, and we'd, we'd go over this little hill, and there were like 200 caribou, a herd of caribou. Somehow they knew that that's where they were. Uh, and um, then they cut loose the, the homiletics and um, leave us behind and, and, and rush off on the skidoos. And they probably killed four or five caribou, uh, all, all for, not for sport, all, all for food to take home to their families and to the community. And skinned right away on the spot. And in fact, um, there was once one caribou skin that we ended up using under our uh, sleeping bags that night in, in the igloo uh, to keep us warm. That was an extraordinary experience, and that happened uh, several times over the course of the two or so, two or three years that I, I went to Cape Dorset. Um, I often wonder what happened. I, I, it would be good to get in touch with some of those guys. Timun Alariak, uh, Joanna C is gone, but uh, Timun is the young fellow who's doing the sand animation and who also did The Magic Man, The Moving Rocks. Because he went off to the Emily Carr School in Vancouver, and, I, and I've lost touch with him. And I, I should try to track him down. Um, the, uh, after after uh, 
Cape Dorset, we started a, a film workshop in Frobisher Bay, and it's now Iqaluit. Frobisher Bay, as I'm sure you know, is, is the largest uh, community in the Eastern Arctic on, on Baffin Island, the kind of the center of the Eastern Arctic, now the capital of, of Nunavut. Um, and, that, and that's where we started a, a, a super eight uh, millimeter filmmaking workshop. And just as in Cape Dorset, where they were shooting on 16 millimeter with the animation stand, and the film had to be shipped off to Montreal to go through a film lab at the NFB, and then they'd get the rushes back a couple of weeks later on the plane. The plane only came in twice a week. And if you missed the plane, you know, you'd be in a, a few days later. So it, also in Frobisher Bay, we would shoot, uh, the, the, the young filmmakers would go out and shoot in, in Super 8 and send it down to, uh, to Montreal and we'd, we'd put it through the, the lab and transfer it to 16 millimeter and send it back up for screenings. Um, let me move ahead here. So here I am in my little, uh, this is where I lived in the summertime just outside of Frobisher Bay. In, uh, I remember the morning when the uh, <clears throat> when I went to sleep, it was ice in the bay, and I woke up in the morning, it was all blue. Well, the wind had come up overnight and pushed the ice out to sea, and everyone in town was going crazy, putting their boats in the water for the first time in like six or seven months. This is, uh, well, I'll tell you the story about this film after you watch it. The first film, really, I think, made by an Inuit fellow in a uh, live-action film. Mm -hmm. Ami yo lewa ma ata ta kukare male khata lap tu wali Ami yo lewa ma ata ta kukare male khata lap tu wali Miki yo lewa ma ata ta So, this film was made by a, a young, young boy, really, Moshe Michael was his name. And uh, Moshe was uh, in the detention center in Frobisher Bay. He'd done some petty crime and he was locked up. And uh, his, uh, the counselor brought him down to, to our little workshop and introduced 
them to me and um, I showed them how to use a camera. We were very concerned about imposing our values of how to make a film on these uh, folks, you know. They'd learned how to make these animated films in Cape Dorset. There's a large, a long cultural, artistic heritage in Cape Dorset. And uh, obviously you see some of that in the, in the work they were doing with, with, with sand and some of the other techniques. Um, but Moshe, I showed Moshe how to use the camera. He was very enthusiastic. I went and visited him in his, in his room in the, in the detention center and it was, his room was covered with photographs that he'd taken, little snapshots, beautifully composed photographs. So he obviously had an eye. And uh, he came to me on this like second or third day and said that the group of them were going on a, on a seal hunt and he'd like to take, could he take the camera on the seal hunt? Now we only had two cameras. <laughs> and they were very precious things. And uh, I didn't know this boy very well, and I, you know, I was like, oh, well, okay, to be careful, you know, don't get it wet, and uh, good luck. And we had these um, special cases, the Pelican cases, the waterproof cases. And I didn't know if I'd ever see the camera again or, or what would happen, but he came back a week later, and we sent the footage off to Montreal, and came back a week or two later, and, and, and screen. Now he, there are very few edits, splices in what you just saw. I think there's like three splices. He was editing the film <coughs> in the camera, as we say. So he would take a shot of you, and he would take a shot of what you were looking at. He, 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 was, he was editing the film as he was shooting it. He wasn't thinking about needing to worry about having to edit later. I mean, every shot was in focus. There wasn't the excessive zooming as there often is in amateur filmmakers' first films. It, it was a it was an extraordinary kind of piece of art. And I know you were very and maybe some vegetarians in the audience, but when when the uh, or people who don't like guns too much, but when they shoot the seal and then uh, start eating the uh, seal meat, when you're sitting with a group of Inuit people watching this, they're going crazy. They're laughing. They're uh, talking to each other. They're saying how delicious that must be, and all that sort of thing. It's a whole. When you watch films with these people, they're they're having a good time. You know, they're uh, enjoying it, appreciating it, and sharing it with each other. So it's a very different experience than us watching it kind of antiseptically here today. Because that, uh, and especially when they saw this first film that anyone I think had shot of a seal hunt, it was just revelatory and extraordinary. John Grierson, who started the National Film Board of Canada and coined the word documentary, this crusty Scott who came to Canada just before the war, uh, he, he, his, his belief was that documentary should, should be a tool for social change and that documentary was a, a way of empowering people, empowering the working class, he talked about, the working man. Uh, and in a way that I think they were, these Inuit people were starting to understand how film could be a tool for them too, both to preserve their language and their culture and also to share their adventures. So uh, it chokes me up just thinking about, about that day when we first saw Moshe Michael's first uh, film of his uh, seal hunt. Um, Got a few. If anyone wants to ask questions as I talk away here, feel free. Here's Moshe, and there's um, the very, very few pictures of Moshe Michael, sadly, uh, especially because he really was, I think, uh, the first uh, Inuit filmmaker. Um, there he is splicing away with Super 8 millimeter uh, tape splicer and viewer. Some of you probably made films that way. You can see his box of Etrochrome 100. Here's uh, his instructor. Um, <laughs> and I was, I, was, I was looking at this uh, earlier, and it says, I don't know if you could read it, it says, take to, uh, take to the airport, and uh, it's instructions on shipments to Montreal. We'd ship the film out on the plane and we'd phone ahead and say it's coming and 
someone would be at the other end from the NFB would pick it up at the Nordair uh, up at Dorval and get into the lab as soon as possible and get it back up north. We try to get them to turn it around you know, within a week, but it usually was two weeks. I'm just 24 years old here. One of the younger kids who came. It became a hangout, this place, the workshop, you know? Kids would come and have fun with each other. Take to Nordair Cargo. Send collect. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> Call Montreal and give them the waybill number. There, that's fun. These are some of the kids. We so we had the super eight millimeter cameras that they would take out uh, on the land, and then we had these studio cameras uh, that we'd use for other stuff. You can see someone editing there in the background. Peter Etinawar was also came to the workshop. Peter, uh, if uh, any of you who saw our film, The Experimental Eskimos, uh, he became Canada's first Inuit Member of Parliament and uh, now works at Queen's Park for the Ontario government in land claims issues for Aboriginal people. And he, became, he and I are the same age, born within a few days of each other, actually, and we became very good friends. We would chase girls around Frobisher Bay uh, when we were 24 years old. That was a major preoccupation. Not too many of them would come back to my silly little tent in the, in the rocks, but Peter was more successful. <laughs> now, uh, that first film, uh, Natsik Hunting, which Moshe made, uh, he, he, the, the soundtrack is just him singing a couple of songs about hunting. They're songs about hunting. They're very uh, happy songs. And then he came to Montreal in uh, the end of that year, we, he shot some more footage on another hunt. And he, wa he thought that his first film wasn't professional enough. You know, we were looking at films all the time. I would show them films, NFB films, all sorts of films. We'd, every day, practically, we'd see another film. A wonderful film about going up the Nahani, uh, which is a gorgeous uh, film and a very good film to teach filmmaking shots that you need to get to make a sequence work, etc. So he thought his films were professional enough and, be, and because he was obviously one of the more enthusiastic, creative young, young filmmakers, we brought him down to Montreal and he cut his next film there. And I helped him a little bit. And he did a more kind of professional sounding piece of music. This is very interesting because this is both within the same year. It's kind of like a Tom Thompson sketch, which he would do out in the field on these little boards, and a Tom Thompson canvas, which we would do later in the winter time uh, in the studio. So this is the, this is another hunting trip, but it's, it's, you'll see it's kind of changed. I'd like to let you share for just a few minutes an experience I've captured and put together on film. At Ilkaloi, or Frobisher Bay, in the Northwest Territories of Canada, there is a place called Ikayoktawi, a Northern Correctional Center. When a person is convicted of a crime and has a short-term sentence, he can be transferred from a jail anywhere in the Arctic to Ikayoktawi, which means a place to get help. The inmate is simply called a member and the officer is called a staff. During their time at the center, members can bring their families on hunting trips down the bay. I spent three weeks as a member. During one summer trip, I brought along a Super 8 millimeter camera and made this film. Modern ways of living have changed the way Inuit hunt. Machines have made transportation much easier and faster. Before guns and ammunition came, 
the Inuit depended on each other. Sealskin umiaks and kayaks were their main transportation, and harpoons were their most important hunting tool. Shooting that, the seal reminds me of uh, one day I came into the workshop and uh, the room was packed, but just kind of like this small room packed with people. And they were watching some footage that had come in from Montreal. Somebody had gone out on, on one of these trips. It wasn't motion, somebody else. And uh, everyone was staring at the screen. It was just a white screen. There was maybe way off in the distance some mountains and ice. Just most of the frame was ice. And everyone in the room was laughing uproariously. I didn't get it. I was a stupid uh, Haluna. Haluna means, I was, I was the ultimate Haluna because Haluna means man with bushy eyebrows. <laughs> My father and I have bushy eyebrows. So I stood at the back of the room and they were watching and laughing and laughing and all I could see was ice and some mountains way back in the distance. And again, they were pointing and laughing and laughing. <clears throat> so, and then that reel finished and that, the lights went up and everyone went back to editing or talking or whatever they were doing. So I said, what, what was that all about? Why were, what was so funny? You didn't see the seal? And it, I didn't see the seal. So, you know, they threaded it up for me again, this stupid white guy. And there was a dot, kind of like this, whatever dot tiny little dot on the screen, little, which was a little black head of a seal who'd s poked his nose out of the hole in the ice. I couldn't even see it. And for them, this was a, a lovely little piece of filmmaking. Uh, so we had different ways of seeing and different perceptions. When I watch these films now, you know, I'm an editor and I've made uh, many, many films. They, you know, they, they seem a bit slow, a little bit hokey. But uh, this was a pace that they were very happy with, uh, at the, certainly at the time. Uh, there was no rush, and you would enjoy it, and you'd, you'd be talking throughout the screening, too. Mm -hmm. You know, we're watching these, but, but people would be talking, they'd be talking about the boat, or they'd be talking about, oh, there's Joe, you know, and that guy can't shoot, look at the bullet skipping across <laughs> the water, what a terrible shot. They'd be laughing at that, and this. Do you had a question? Yeah, it was a jail. It was a, it's kind of minimum security jail, but that's where you'd go if you'd uh, break any, breaking and entering or something. Oh, but the idea is you go for real help. Yeah, right. rehabilitation and taking them off on hunting trips was a way of, of helping them, uh, you know, reintegrate into the community in a way and get help from each other. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. I, I really fell in love with the North because of these wonderful people who had a great sense of humor and great fun and great camaraderie. We enjoyed each other's company very much. Um, but sadly, Moshe uh, passed away just a few years ago um, on the streets of Toronto. He, 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 came, he, this was, uh, he came to Toronto and he looked me up, and he would sometimes sleep in, in, the, in, in my place on the couch or in the guest room, and I often made him meals, and sometimes I'd buy some of his carvings. He got into carving, and he was in and out of the uh, 
uh, the, the Aboriginal center there on Spadina, just north of Bloor. Um, it's very sad. He, he really be he became an alcoholic, and uh, there are many times I tried to help him in various ways, but eventually uh, he died. It's very sad. This is Moshe, who made that lovely, those lovely hunting films. Um, in 1975, the CBC announced something called the Accelerated uh, Coverage Plan, the ACP, and they were going to bring television to every community in Canada that had more than 500 uh, population. And this included all these small villages in the Arctic. And uh, to bring in these big dishes, to bring down the, the uh, television signal from the Anik B satellite. Anik had just been launched. And so Inuit uh, communities were asked, do you want television? And uh, 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 we'll come to your community, we'll tell you about television, and you can have a vote and that sort of thing. Often they would send a letter back saying, just send in the, the dish, you know, we don't need to have a vote. We know about television, we want it. But there was one community, well, there were several in Arctic Quebec, and one in, in on Baffin Island, and one in, in just west of Baffin Island, in Glulik, who said, no, we don't want television until we know how to make television. Uh, we've seen what television has done in Frobisher Bay, and we're worried about the impact of television. There were some very progressive leaders in Glulik, including Noah Nasuk, the, the Anglican minister. And so, um, I was involved in, after I worked at Frobisher Bay, the, they asked me to go to uh, Iglulik and teach uh, filmmaking there. And so I, I, I started the film, first film workshop in Iglulik. Iglulik is where Zach Kunick comes from. Some of you may have seen The Fast Runner. That's an arduit, The Fast Runner, or the, the journals of Rasmus and Zach's film. Zach's partner was uh, Paul Apak, who wrote uh, Atanarjuit, and he was in this little workshop that I had in the Glulik back in uh, 1976. And, um, and a few years later, I made this film, Magic in the Sky, which is about the coming of television to these villages and how television was changing things and how the people of the Glulik in particular, are, we focused on some of the villages in Arctic Quebec and the, and the village of the Glulik. So I'll play you a clip from Magic in the Sky. It's called Magic in the Sky because the Hudson's Bay Company were, met, were marketing television sets uh, in, uh, in the Bay stores. And they advertised them. They called it Magic in the Sky. This is how you'll be receiving all the, the world will come to you through the satellite. When television first came, the effect of television on the community was very drastic. People no longer visited their neighbor, children did not play outside, and the interactive uh, activities uh, of the community in general are, are, are broken down. President of the Inuit Brotherhood, John Amahualik. No longer visit their neighbors to discuss community issues, um, and uh, and in that way, uh, the life of the community starts to fall apart. The home, the family, was the last refuge of the Inupi language, and television, by coming into the home, was invading this last refuge. One day, we were relatively isolated from the rest of the world, and the next morning, television was upon us, and uh, the whole world was dropped in our laps. And uh, um, people were in shock. Uh, they didn't realize that the, uh, all of a sudden, overnight, the whole world shrunk on them. And uh, uh, instead of uh, hearing about wars on, on radio, they actually saw it on, uh, right, in, right in their living room. The blast and the shrapnel from the rocket casing killed two children almost instantly. 
Another child is critically wounded. The parents and a grandparent, with lesser wounds and in shock, gather the dead and living on their front porch. When an average Chinook who doesn't understand English sees so much violence on TV, they're not sure if it's fiction or if it's a news item. The foundation of our culture has always been the concept of sharing things. And television suggested that sharing really didn't have any place in the lives of people. The 1982 Mercury LN7 Sport Coupe. The science, the technology. Commercials suggest that people have to watch out for number one and that people should go after these things for their own benefits. LN7 recaptures the romance between you and your Television creates a wrong image in their minds. Strap one on. Television projects uh, an unreal world uh, to them. Uh, I suspect if they came down here, they would be very disappointed. And then there's golf. First of all, what is grass? Secondly, why would all these people want to watch somebody slowly kicking a little white ball for a couple of miles in a sunny afternoon when they could be hunting? What do you want? Let's go back to By not reflecting the northern realities, the northern scenery, the northern struggles, must make them wonder whether they are marginal people. It's a very compelling medium. People use it endlessly. And if it's that compelling and that endlessly used, then it should damn well be able to be at the service of the Inuit people who are going through rapid social change and need communication systems to understand and get more control over their lives and their institutions. The Inuit village of Saglak on the Arctic coast of Quebec. Though most Inuit settlements accepted TV without question, five communities in northern Quebec voted to reject CBC's offer. They wanted television, but on their own terms. The Inuit secured government grants and set up their own Inuit language TV network, Takramuit Nipingat, or TNI. <laughs> TNI's president, Joseph P. Padliat. This is Paul Apak that I mentioned eh? from McLuhan. Uh, he was, uh, he became Zach Koenig's uh, partner when they started his sumo. Here he is uh, shooting some stuff for um, Inukshuk. There he is dressed in caribou skins. Uh, the the, the, the porta pad this is using a video outside, which is kind of crazy because the batteries get cold very quickly. We actually designed these uh, special uh, battery packs, which you would wear close to your skin, keep them warm, and a wire going out into the camera. Here he's got his battery and his porta pack wrapped up in a sleeping bag while he's filming uh, some caribou hunting. Paul also sadly uh, passed away um, of colon cancer. Lovely guy. Here, here we are in Eskimo Point. I also did some teaching and some filming in Eskimo Point on the west coast of Hudson Bay. This was another community that was part of the Inukshuk project. I think there were six communities. Baker Lake, Eskimo Point, Glulik, Pond Inlet, Frobisher. And then T&I, that group in Arctic Quebec, was another, uh, another separate experiment in filmmaking. Here you see they're also using a, a video camera with a port it pack black and white. Look like they're having a good time. So here's the, this is the teleconferencing piece, I believe. One of the purposes of our television project was to use television to understand ourselves, um, to, to remember our past, but also to broaden our horizons. And so I think for that reason, understanding the world through television is very important. We want to use television 
not only to protect our language and culture, but as a means of artistic expression. And I think it's very important for any group of people to be able to express themselves artistically. Working with low-cost portable video cameras and recorders, the Inuit had six months to prove to the government that they could produce their own TV programs and run their own TV network. writing the script, producing it, directing it. For the first time, we can do everything ourselves. <laughs> Inuit history and culture is almost several thousand years old, and the more we know about it, the more we're convinced that it's an extremely rich culture which deserves to be known by other people, not just in Canada, but around the world. With a special hookup through the Annex satellite, Inukshuk can be used for live teleconferences between the six member communities. In a Glulix Hamlet office, audiences can see and talk with relatives and friends 900 kilometers away in Frobisher Bay. Inukshuk's community coordinator in Naglulik is Joe Atugutalam. This was the first time that had happened, you know, as an experiment and they could see their children but the children down there couldn't see their parents but they could hear the voices. Today parents in Iglulik are talking with their children away at high school in Frobisher Bay. You know, it was some, some sort of magic you know, just like that that you could talk to your children just pressing a button. They see pictures uh, coming out of Frobisher and they say smile and they smile and everybody's having a ball on the first night that we first opened. Daddy, <laughs> how Teleconferencing was used by the education committees, the hunters and trappers associations, the political leaders of the community to share ideas and to get a feeling as to how uh, other people in the communities feel about certain issues. Teleconferencing allowed people to have a conference on issues without leaving their families. But I think it's very important for these people to be able to see their own people on TV. It gives them confidence and pride in the Inuit's ability to evolve, to be able to adapt to technological change and make good use of it. With Inukshuk, the power of the camera is in Inuit hands. Fifty years ago, when some of the first cameras were brought into the north, Inuit were always at the other end of the lens. They were seen as a simple and friendly race. They were called the Smiling People. The Inu 
we probably are the most photographed race of people on earth. The first time I, I saw a white man, uh, he had a camera, and, and it seems that uh, whenever government officials or tourists came north, they always had cameras, and uh, they projected what we considered to be the wrong images of the unit, the Hollywood image or the stereotype image. In 1958, Anthony Quinn played Inuk in Paramount Pictures' The Savage Innocence, complete with Hawaiian Eskimos and styrofoam eagles. Southern filmmakers tend to romanticize a lot of things. They over-dramatize, and uh, what is probably considered very ordinary by our people is taken as being very extraordinary by Southern standards, and it creates a wrong image. Up to ten years ago, nearly all the Eskimos were like those three magnificent. North of Iglulik, on the west coast of Baffin Island. That's jo uh, John Amahalik who's speaking throughout that piece, the, the, the well-spoken Inuit uh, gentleman. He became the first uh, president of the uh, Inuit Tapnitsa, the Eskimo Brotherhood, and became a very good friend of mine. <clears throat> he really should have been called the director or the co-director of this film, Magic in the Sky, because so much of it is him expressing his feelings uh, about, about the, what they feared with television coming into these villages and how they wanted to try to control television and a discourse on the history of the Inuit people always being photographed and not having the power to photograph others. It's very much his story that he wanted, things he wanted to say. So. I felt like I was just sort of helping him uh, be a filmmaker too, in a way. We became very good friends. <coughs> um, it reminded me that business of the teleconferencing. When, when, when uh, Inuit were sent from, from Cape Dorset to, um, to the World's Fair in Osaka, I think it was 1970, they, they were given, uh, the, the carvers were given uh, audio cassette recorders. Um, and were encouraged to uh, talk into these machines, and, and, and the Canadian government would uh, send these cassette tapes back to their villages uh, so they could, you know, they were like audio diaries or, or audio letters. These people were skipping the, the Gutenberg age altogether, uh, going right from the oral tradition to the electronic uh, uh, world. Never, uh, never learning to read and write. These old, these elderly carvers, and and here we are, not that many years later, uh, uh, teleconferencing, doing it often uh, far in advance of people in, in in corporations and banks in the south who do it now all the time uh, to communicate among their their people. Um, so much more. I I, I don't know if, if if I can go on a, a bit longer. If people are getting tired. I've got one more clip I'd really like to show you. Um, we, uh, from Between Two Worlds, because we started this uh, with, the, with the picture of, of Joseph Hidlout that's, that's on that poster. And I want to, uh, in 1990, I, I produced this film that Barry Greenwald uh, directed in, um, in Pond Inlet about Joseph. Uh, really, the, really, again, it's Peter Panloo telling the story. And we, white filmmakers uh, being kind of helping, being vehicles for them to tell their own stories. Here's a clip from uh, Between Two Worlds. Joseph Idlout. He will be the main character in two books. Articles will be written about him, and he will feature in documentary films and newsreels seen around the world. Joseph Idlout is about to become a symbol of his people. There had been other films about Inuit. Thomas Edison was the first to film them in 1901 at the Buffalo Exposition. They had been brought south to provide what the exposition management thought of as exotic entertainment. They performed among plaster icebergs in temperatures of 90 degrees. They were a great hit. Exposition brochures assured visitors that they were a people as cleanly as the Japanese.
The best known film about an Eskimo is Nanook of the North. Through Robert Flaherty's 1922 film, the world came to know Inuit as a happy, smiling people who could survive the utmost adversity. Nanook is the enduring image of Inuit, a romantic portrait of a primitive people struggling to survive in the most hostile environment on earth. Thirty years later, Doug Wilkinson will follow in this tradition with his film, Land of the Long Day. The first thing we do on awakening is to climb the hill back of the camp and search the sea with our telescopes, looking for whales. For we are Eskimo. Our life is the hunt. This will be the last time it will be possible to make a film with the Inuit hunter as hero. To this day, people the world over still believe that this is how all Inuit live. It is an image of a way of life frozen in time. With, with my colleagues uh, Tom Radford and, and Barry Greenwell, and we made several several other films in the north over the over the years. Always kind of making films uh, we didn't feel about, but with with the Inuit people. That, that clip didn't include Peter Panaloo, but he was the main uh, speaker in that film, talking about his father. Uh, we made a film about Vilmir Stephenson, the famous Arctic explorer. It was not so much. Uh, from the perspective of, of Stephenson, but of the Inuit, um, a son he left behind. Uh, I'll just show you a brief clip from that. Between Joseph Idlout. Sorry. Here's Vilmir Stephenson, Icelandic Canadian, famous explorer, claimed to have discovered the blonde Eskimos. That's the picture he took of the copper uh, Inuit. He was. Uh, very good at getting publicity for himself. Eager to bask in the glory, Stephenson travels south, finally catching a ride on a passing whaler journeying to Herschel Island, returning to the colonial outpost. His arrival shocks the whalers and Inuit alike, who had given him up for dead. While they marvel at his exploits, Stephenson confronts a ghost from the past he unexpectedly meets his country wife, Panagapla, and their son, Alex, whom Stephenson has not seen for over three years. When the barge came, she met Stephenson, grabbed by his tie, holding him up. Doko Daxia, Doko Daxia, she's gonna kill him, she's gonna kill him. Panagapluk makes him accountable forcing him to acknowledge the kid on the spot in the presence of policemen and whalers, etc. Stephenson quietly acknowledges the relationship and pays for the baptism of Alex and Panagabla, accepting his role as father and husband. Between ice trips, Stephenson lives again with Panagabla in the cabin she built. His absence has been difficult on their son, Alex. He had real tough life. My dad had real tough life. He said he was very abused a lot for being a little white kid. If your father is white and you have a different mother, people still call you names. Stephenson tries to make it up to Alex. They spend time together and become friends. Stephenson taught him to read and to write and father and son would speak about New York and the East Coast. And it seems that Stephenson was, in a way, preparing his son for coming out. This is a part of the Stephenson story that uh, had never been told before from the Inuit point of view. And uh, the grandchildren of Stephenson had never been interviewed about this before, never spoken publicly publicly about this before. So we were very proud of that film as um, enabling these people to 
to tell the story of this great man who was considered a great man uh, from their perspective, the children that he, that he left behind. There are many stories of uh, explorers, filmmakers too, who go north and leave children behind. Another clip I'd like to show you from a film about uh, the first Inuit uh, author of a book. final days alone in the vast system of sanatoriums built to treat native peoples in Canada. He was writing an autobiography, I Nuliak, about growing up in Nuvialuit, close to the creatures of the tundra and the sea. Segregated from the strange world outside his window, thousands of kilometers from home, the words he wrote took him back to the land of his ancestors. One. I, Nuliak, will tell you a story. It is the story of what has happened to me in my life. All my adventures, many of them forever graven in my memory. Because I was the Iliapak, the poor little orphan boy, I really knew what misery meant. My clothes were a little better than rags. But my mind was always alert to the happenings around me. Once my eyes had seen something, it was never forgotten. America and the ancient culture of the Inuit North. The collision took place in the lifetime of one man, Nuliuk, who died in Edmonton of tuberculosis in 1966. Before his death, he finished the first history of the North written by an Inuit. The Inuvialuit, in the space of two or three generations, underwent a degree of change as great or greater than that of any other human group in all of history that survived in the end. They came as close to being destroyed as you can imagine, and it's surprising, really, that they weren't. Someone of his generation, born in 1895, and living through that whole shift, no matter what he would talk about, it's an important record of a human life. Our culture and traditions are still very much alive because of people like my grandfather. We had to know about the past in order to know who we are. I think what's said there about very, becoming very close to extinction is, is uh, kind of a theme of this in that I think television filmmaking uh, came along at, at, at a very opportune moment in the Arctic. And when there were still people old enough to remember uh, the days of living uh, on the land and, and articulate and were able to share those stories and those traditions and having their memories and their uh, knowledge recorded by these young filmmakers, their legends and their stories and their animated films and their their knowledge often in the documentary films of, of hunting. Um, and, and the Inuit, I, I think among many, perhaps any Aboriginal people in the world are, seem to be the most adaptable. They seem to have been able to, to survive and, and, and continue and adapt and use technology rather than be abused by it. There's still a great deal of uh, 
of suicide and, 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 and alcoholism and drug abuse and glue sniffing and I've lost quite a few friends that I was very close to in the early 70s, including Moshe Michael and Paul Apak, who, who I've told you about this evening. Um, that's why it's, it's been <coughs> wonderful, but often kind of painful for me to go back and, re and review this time in making uh, and putting together this presentation. But I think it's a hopeful, actually quite a hopeful future. The Inuit Broadcasting Corporation now, which took over from that Inukshuk project, those six communities, uh, seems to be doing very well. They, they make children's uh, TV shows, they make documentaries and news programs and dramas. Uh, Zacharias Kunik, Kunik from Iglulik, who was born on the land, you know, and uh, moved into these. Uh, I talked to him on the phone just the other day because I was looking for pictures of Paul, and he said we were uh, when we first moved to Iglulik, we were so much better off on the land where 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 an igloo was warm in the winter and a, and a tent was was cozy, and we were moved into these terrible tar paper shacks where which were freezing in the winter. There was no insulation. But uh, he's become a very successful filmmaker and has, uh, 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 his films are, are praised and win prizes at film festivals the world over. So it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a, in a way it's a, it's a tough story, but I think it ultimately it's a, it's a hopeful story. And I was uh, really honored to be uh, a part of it and, and just to observe it and be a, a witness to the changes that happened in those little communities in the uh, 1970s and early 80s.